Why should we read and study John Milton today? Isn't he among the very old ones far from our world? Well, actually, John Milton is one of those people who really contributed to shape our free and democratic society. He was extremely open-minded and he lived in the 17th century. He was a poet and an intellectual who wrote in Latin, Greek and Italian and reached international renown. He condemned pre-publication censorship, for example, in his Aeropagetica, published in 1644, uh, which stands among the most influential defenses of freedom of speech and freedom of press. His need for freedom extended to style too, and he introduced new words coined from Latin. An example is pandemonium, or earth-shaking, or even terrific, but with a meaning of terrifying, not as we use it today. And he was the first modern writer to employ unrhymed verse outside of the theatre or outside of the th translations. His life paralleled the major events of Stuart Britain. He studied, travelled, wrote poetry and became increasingly popular under Charles I, a difficult monarch to deal with. Charles I quarrelled with the Parliament because he believed in the divine right of kings. He married a Catholic and fought the armies of English and Scottish parliaments during the Civil War, and he was finally defeated and executed. Among Milton's most relevant works, published in 1649, there is his Iconoclastus, which is an explicit defense of the regicide, in which Milton tried to break the powerful image of Charles I. The literal uh, meaning of iconoclastic is the image breaker. He also wrote in defense of divorce for all. Divorce was at a time only for the very rich. The very rich were the only ones who could afford divorce, but Milton's divorce tracts, written between 1643 and 1645, uh, in his tracts he argues for the legitimacy of divorce on grounds of spousal incompatibility. Under the Commonwealth of England he was placed in public office, but the restoration, which brought back Charles II from his exile in France in 1660, marked a deep change in Milton's life and deprived him of his public role. However, it is during this period that, though completely blind, he finished most of his major works. Among them, the poem When I Consider How My Light Is Spent, which was later titled On His Blindness by an editor, and his magnum opus, which is Paradise Lost, as you know. He was a champion of liberty, and his literary legacy is deep. If we consider the poets and artists who came after him, for example, William Blake considered Milton the major English poet, and Edmund Burke, who was a theorist of the sublime, regarded his description of hell as exemplary of sublimity as an aesthetic concept. For Burke, it was to be set along mountain tops, a storm at sea, and infinity. In the Victorian age, George Eliot and Thomas Hardy were particularly inspired by Milton's poetry and biography, and the hostility of 20th century criticism by T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound did not reduce Milton's stature. Milton's Aeropagitica is still cited as relevant to the First Amendment of the United States Constitution and, can you believe that, the title of Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials trilogy is derived from a quotation from Paradise Lost, His Dark Materials to Create More Worlds, which is line 915 of Book 2, in case you want to check. Today we can say that Paradise Lost has been translated more times in the last 30 years than in the previous 300. His description of Satan is appealing both because of his anti-authoritarian rhetoric and for his eloquent, psychologically complex and morally ambiguous mind. He seems to be described as neither entirely good nor entirely evil. He is the leader of a failing cause and a tragic hero. 
This is a short video recording to the 2020 pandemic, a time Milton would probably have accurately described and analysed. If he lived today, he might decide to write a new Aeropagitica to defend freedom of press or freedom of speech in this time of lockdown, or a new defence of divorce for abused women and children who cannot leave their homes, or a new iconoclastis to dethrone those people whose thirst for power has made them too manipulative and arrogant to care for the majority of their citizens, to look after the, the weaker ones or to defend our planet. Maybe the time has come for us to read Virginia Woolf's words again and understand them fully, no longer as men or women, but as citizens of this world. Maybe the time has come for us to think and act. She wrote in A Room of One's Own. My belief is that if we live another century or so, I am talking of the common life, which is the real life, and not of the little separate lives which we live as individuals, and have 500 a year each of us in rooms of our own. If we have the habit of freedom and the courage to write exactly what we think, if we escape a little from the common sitting room and see human beings not always in their relation to each other, but in relation to reality, and the sky too, and the trees or whatever it may be in themselves. If we look past Milton's bogey, for no human being should shut out the view. If we face the fact, for it is a fact, that there is no arm to cling to, but that we go alone, and that our relation is to the world of reality, and not only to the world of men and women, then the opportunity will come, and the dead poet, who was Shakespeare's sister, will put on the body which she has so often laid down.